And first, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Joy Fritz. I have a public page on Facebook called The Untrivial Pursuit. I pursue a better understanding and truth in health research. I started my journey because of my experience in death recording. So I have a fair sampling of what it's like to work with physicians, with coroners, and with the local and state vital records registrars on creating death records and what that system is like. And I'll explain about COVID-19, how they're kind of changing and coaching um, physicians to code things and, and structure things on the death certificate in a way that was not typical. We typically did death certificates for people that had underlying conditions. And that is what is reported and coded into our national systems for what causes death. So that's what creates our public health beliefs that the majority of deaths are heart disease related. And then the second leading cause is cancer and you know kidney disease and lung disease. And that's why we believe that certain diseases are fatal and kill us. But I do wanna talk specifically about COVID-19 because that's such a big issue right now and because they're they're doing something very different with how we're coding COVID-19. There's a very specific vulnerable population, not that there aren't exceptions, but we have really good data that there's vulnerable populations and that information is important to be consistent about in our death recording protocols and not change the rule book for one virus. So Let's jump in. I'll show you the memo that we're talking about. This is the National Vital Statistics System sent this out as an alert. And then they say something really interesting right here that's important. It says, will COVID-19 be the underlying cause? This term underlying cause is important. Underlying cause is the last cause listed in part one, and that's what's reported. So if normally it's heart disease or cancer or kidney disease or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is listed as the last line in on the death certificate. So it's saying the underlying cause depends upon what and where conditions are reported on the death certificate. However, the rules for coding and selection of the underlying cause of death are expected to result in COVID-19 being the underlying cause more often than not. That is, I think, an unfair spotlighting in my experience of uh, it, infections causing death in the elderly and immunocompromised. When there's a lot of infections, we should be highlighting if we want to switch the system. But in the down here, they even make it super clear. Should COVID-19 be reported on the death certificate for all decedents where the disease caused or is assumed to have caused or contributed to death? If the decedent had other chronic conditions such as COPD or asthma, that may, uh, COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's a, it's a disease of you know, that, that has issues with our breathing, uh, that may have also contributed. These conditions can be reported in part two. Part two is, is the, the non important part of the death certificate. That was a really big flag to me to see that we are, we're allowing assumed we're allowing things that contributed to the death to be the underlying cause, what has always been accepted and pushed for by our vital records registrars to be recorded, which is they do have a health condition that that would make them more susceptible to dying from something that most people don't die from, then that's the underlying cause of death. It's not the immediate cause. The infection can always be the immediate cause. So I'm, I want to be very clear. I am not advocating for COVID-19 to not be recorded on a death certificate. I am saying, yes, record COVID-19, record it as the immediate cause of death. If if it, it did cause health complications that were able to be diagnosed and monitored, absolutely COVID-19 needs to be on part one. It just, in my opinion of how we've done death certificates up until this point in this country, the underlying cause it's an important structural part of how we do mortality statistics and the underlying cause needs to, well, according to vital records registrars and what they hammered into me for six years, it's the underlying cause is the decline in health. Um, so it's what the person had for two, five, 10 years that began their decline in health that put them at a point that an infection 
could cause their death. So the infection is the immediate cause. And let me show you here what I'm talking about so you guys can see the structure of a death certificate. Okay, so here's an example. We have cerebral hemorrhage. That can kill you by itself. You have nephritis, and then you have cirrhosis of the liver. So cirrhosis of the liver, which was diagnosed two years ago in this patient, would be what's considered the underlying cause of death. Even though the cerebral hemorrhage is the immediate cause, so that's the, the thing that happened a month ago that really led to their decline and then they ended up passing away. But the cirrhosis of the liver put them into a compromised condition that, that, that their health declined after that. So I'll show you here something from my public page on Facebook, a snapshot of physician's handbook for coding death certificates. And it gives a case history of a woman, 78 years old, two years ago, she had had a stroke and then she had this decline, you know, slowly over the course of two years. And then she had a catheter placement. So she had, you know, a medical device placed and infections and complications after that for days that ended up and the sepsis from the, from the infection was what ended up finally causing her death. Now what's listed at the bottom here, and they even added a line to the structured form because that's how important it is to get an understanding of the underlying condition in their mind. And it says old cerebral vascular accident. So an old cerebral vascular accident, which is a stroke can be, is considered the underlying cause for this person's death. So it's a stroke death. That's a stroke death. So when you see in mortality statistics, stroke, you know, people passing away from stroke, that would be what happened. They actually passed away from a urinary tract infection. That's what they died from. But their underlying health condition is what's listed in our, our mortality statistics. So this is an example of one of the states instructing how COVID deaths need to be recorded now. So we have, you know, um, respiratory distress, we have pneumonia. And then the very last line here in part one is COVID-19 for 10 days. Now, if we were to compare that to, you know, something else, what if someone had a, had a stroke or had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease for years and they were declining in their health? Why isn't it that we are putting down on this last line D that they had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? To me, in my experience, that would be typical for a vital records registrar to ask me for, to send back a record and say, I see you put COVID-19, but this person was 70 years old or this person was 60 years old. What were they on medication for? What was, what was their chronic condition? And can you, can you ask the doctor for that? Now, I want to be clear, if the person didn't have, if they were at just super healthy, they weren't on any medi medications, their doctor just giving them a, you're just doing great, right? Or they're younger and they don't have any health conditions, then the doctor would tell me that and I would have to call the vital records registrars and say, hey, look, this doctor is saying there's literally nothing else that explains the death. It's just this. And I can imagine in that scenario, them saying, okay, uh, we, we needed to check, right? Cause that's our standard is, is that the chronic health condition, if that exists to explain why this person died from an infection that a lot of people survive, but they would, after a conversation, after kind of giving some pushback about chronic health conditions, they would then go ahead and approve it because viruses do kill people that don't have underlying health conditions occasionally. But for the most part, you want to understand what that kind of surrounding health condition was. And that's what that final line is. So I hope that helps understand what the significance of the last line of this memo here saying if the decedent had other chronic conditions such as COPD or asthma that may have also contributed, these conditions can be reported in part two. But COPD or asthma are definitely conditions that would put you um, in a more vulnerable position for COVID-19. Okay. I found this really interesting to look at. This is the provisional death counts right now for coronavirus, you know, yesterday. So if we look here at the time frame, we have this many, we have 6,930 COVID deaths. And what I found down here, the far majority of them 
are happening in those over 65 years old to 85. 2,000 of them, so basically a, l a little less than a third, are happening in those over 85 years old. It's definitely hitting a population that likely has a lot of underlying conditions. And then this was interesting for me down here. It gave us a little bit more information of where these deaths are coming from. So out of the 6,930, we have healthcare setting inpatient. So this, these are people that are actually getting the kind of acute care that's perhaps needed with the more serious COVID. We also don't know how many of those people were already in the hospital or, or were in for other conditions. And then they also had COVID. Outpatient or emergency room. So something about emergency room deaths or outpatient deaths. Emergency room deaths, at least in California, emergency room doctors, they usually don't sign death certificates. They're not required to. And they usually don't like doing it either. So it'll normally either go to a coroner if there's no attending physician or it'll go the, to uh, it'll bump back to the hospice or the attending physician. Um, and why that is is because an emergency room doctor doesn't have a full picture of the person's medical condition. You know, it, it, they're they're working with them usually for a few hours just to kind of figure out whether they should stay and before they're either admitted or sent home. So um, the doctor really doesn't have a whole lot of medical record information from the physician or, you know, ac necessarily accurate information on what medications they're on or, you know, or anything if they're presenting with severe situations. So we have 421 emergency room or outpatient deaths. I don't know if that is really a good picture of whether those people had a chest scan and they're able to see and diagnose it clinically on a few different levels. And if they're emergency room, they probably haven't had the three days to get their test results back. So they're probably not being treated with COVID appropriate medications at that point. So did those people really have the best chance? And did they have other underlying health conditions is a good question. We have here healthcare setting dead on arrival. So that basically means that they died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. So, and of course, paramedics aren't able to, you know, diagnose at that point, you don't have a lab test you're not getting treatment. So that to me is not really a, a, a solid case for saying something was COVID or whether there was other reasons of what was going on. Decedent's home. So 519, I mean, that's a good, that's a good bit of, uh, of the, the, the total number. And these are people at home. So I have questions about that. Why didn't they go into the hospital if they were having acute respiratory issues? you should be going into the hospital. And then at that point, you, you know, you would be getting care. So, and this isn't something that is, you know, a few hour onset and then death. So it's, you know, it's an accumulative thing where you're having, you know, a cough, fever, a few different things, a few different signs, and then more acute issues get complicated. And then, you know, hopefully you get into the hospital if you're having respiratory issues. So that we have 519 that died at home, but apparently they died of COVID by their diagnosing COVID by association, which is what something Senator Jensen talked about. If one of their contacts, one of their children had COVID and then they died and that they're, that they're kind of conflating that and saying, well, you know, we'll just call it COVID. To me, that's not, that's not how doctors work. They don't, they don't just assume if you die of pneumonia, you're dying of whatever you know, strain of flu that's going through the area or coronavirus that's going through the area. They don't assume that. They just put down pneumonia and then whatever chronic condition that you had and because that's the facts that they know. And, and Senator Jensen kind of talks about that. So that's kind of a good chunk there is people passing away at home. And then you have hospice facility 78. Are they getting, my question here is, are they getting Ventil and then same thing to see home. Are they getting ventilator care? Are they getting the care that a nursing home, long-term care facility, 600? From what I understand of the care that's available in nursing homes and under hospice care, you're not getting intensive, you know, respiratory techs and things like that. It's kind of comfort care. So there's, you know, nursing staff there, but there's not all the technology that a hospital has to manage an infection like this. Um, and you're 
if you're in hospice care or a long-term nursing facility, then you usually have a chronic health condition that needs monitoring. Those deaths would always typically on death certificates have an underlying cause. They would have a chronic condition that led them to be in hospice care or led them to be in a nursing home. And that would be their explanation of death, no matter what infection they died from. So we're looking at a little over, we're looking at about 1600 to 1700 deaths out of the 6930. So that's, to me, that's a significant part of our deaths being reported that are very questionable that did they die from COVID or did they die because they didn't get to the hospital and get the ventilator that they needed? Um, did they die from COVID or these people that are in nursing homes and hospice facilities and are at home having comfort care at home, maybe they died because they, they chose to not go into the hospital and get care or an assumed case, like the, the document says, if it's assumed to have about 1700 of the total 6,900 deaths being under question because of the way that we're coding things and the way that we know that typically we, we structure death, then that's a significant portion of our mortality data on COVID-19 that I would question. And I would question the ones that are in the hospital too, whether they had underlying conditions and whether we would normally code that. Now, I want to speak to the difference that I saw of how hospital doctors do death certificates and how hospice doctors and uh, attending, you know, regular primary care physicians do death certificates. And this is just an observation. And it, it, I think it also has to do with their relationship with the patient. So as we saw here, we have a lot of these deaths being in the hospital, right? So they're inpatient at the hospital, 5,000 of them. When you have a doctor treating someone for an acute condition in the hospital, they don't, they haven't known that patient for years and years and years, like a primary care physician would, or a hospice physician would. They don't have, they usually don't have, especially in that kind of setting, they don't have all of their medical records in front of them. You know, we're still at a certain point where digital and electronic medical records aren't readily available for every single doctor to the hospital in, in good timing. So the hospitalist or whoever's treating the patient may or may not have a good picture of their underlying decline in health, whether there was one or whether their, their symptoms were very well managed and they were really healthy and they were active. And, you know, yes, they were on medications for some things, but they were super healthy. Hospital doctors would normally put a much more kind of small time frame of what caused death. And it's usually just what they treated the patient for, because that's what they they're, you know, in a legal mentality of what can I say that I know about this patient's health? And usually that just encompasses what did I treat them for? And so the hospital doctors will normally put or typically put something that's a lot shorter of a time frame. The vital records registrars will normally push back and say, yeah, but did they have any underlying health conditions? And then the doctor will have to, well, I don't know, I have to talk to the primary care physician and I'll give him a call. And it takes a few days. So sometimes they get bumped back and forth and kind of push to put a chronic health condition. But, um, but they'll t typically the first worksheet I would get back from them would be something that was much more just immediate, what was treated in the hospital and what went wrong that led to the death, you know, or what kind of complicated into death. So that's my own two cents on why naturally speaking, how the death certificate system would work, even if national vital statistics system was not trying to coach doctors. I think that we would have a lot more COVID-19 deaths listed as the underlying cause of death because a lot of these patients are in the hospital dying and hospital doctors tend to put they treated them for there. So I think we would still probably have a lot of those 5,000 still there without the coaching. But I think that the other 1,700 and, and how we're going to be moving forward with pressuring doctors or coaching them to, to structure causes in a certain way is definitely uh, problematic for, for being consistent and scientific in our way of um, doing death certificates.